We are delighted to welcome you to this first edition series of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival. It is a pleasure to present today, What the Heck Do I Do With My Life? Ravi Venkatesan in conversation with Noshad Forbes. What the heck do I do with my life? Our world will change more in this century than in all of human history, driven by many factors, including technology, climate change, demographics, and inequality. Such extreme change is throwing up unprecedented opportunities and creating an adaptive challenge for individuals, organizations, and societies. There are clear signs everywhere that we need new ways to think about the world and our place in it. Our old ideas about education, lifestyle, success, and happiness no longer work. In What the Heck Do I Do With My Life, Ravi Venkatesan makes the case that successful adaptation in the new century requires a paradigm shift, a different mindset, new skills, and new strategies. Ravi also reflects on how we will need to live life more intentionally, making deliberate choices about who we are, what we do, and how we live, rather than simply being carried along like a piece of driftwood. In conversation with author and co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, Noshad Forbes. Ravi Venkatesan. Ravi Venkatesan is a business leader, author, and social entrepreneur who's currently UNICEF's special representative for young people and innovation. He's the founder of the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship and serves on the boards of Hitachi Limited and Rockefeller Foundation. Ravi was the chairman of Microsoft India, Bank of Baroda, and Cummins India, and is the author of Conquering the Chaos, Win in India, Win Everywhere. Noshad Forbes. Noshad Forbes' book, The Struggle and the Promise, Restoring India's Potential is being released by HarperCollins in January 2022. He has co-authored from Followers to Leaders, Managing Technology and Innovation in Newly Industrializing Countries. Forbes is the co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, India's leading steam engineering and control instrumentation firm, and the chairman of Ananta Aspen Center and Center for Technology, Innovation, and Economic Research. We now invite Mr. Kapish Mehra, Managing Director, Rupa Publications India, to say a few words about the book. A very good afternoon to everybody who's joined here. This is certainly a very important moment in the journey of Ravi Venkatesan's writing career. Uh, what the heck do I do with my life is a fascinating book and that encapsulates what Ravi has learned over the years in the space of management and business. Uh, I'm glad that we're having this session today where we discuss the various aspects of the book because as we embrace uh, 2022 and the years ahead, a lot of challenges lie in front of us. What will be the management mantras? Will the old ones stand in good stead as we move ahead? Are there things that need to be changed? Are the fundamentals in, in uh, the right place, etc, etc. Ravi does a fascinating work of looking at all of them from a new perspective and I think that's his strength and that's the strength of the book. So with this, I wish Ravi and everybody associated with this function the very best. Thank you, Mr. Kapish Mehra. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, what the heck do I do with my life? Ravi Venkatesan in conversation with Noshant Forbes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this conversation with Ravi Venkatesan. Uh, Ravi, this is a real pleasure. Uh, you know, we used to spend time chatting. Uh, we haven't in recent years. Uh, and it's uh, it's 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 time to it's time to catch up. Uh, I have to start also by saying that I I really enjoyed I really enjoyed your book, uh, and I enjoyed your book. Um, you know, and thanks thanks very much to JLF uh, that I enjoyed the book because I have to admit that I generally don't read self-improvement books, not because I don't need self-improvement, but I don't have the time for it. 
uh, and I also don't read spiritual books. And as I read the book, uh, I came, came away with this sense that this was actually a spiritual book, uh, <laughs> a book that really gets at the essence of uh, what it is to be human. Uh, you end with a wonderful quote that we will end with too. Um, and I think that's the essence of spirituality. It's uh, what is the human spirit all about? How do you really deliver on that human spirit? Uh, how do you fulfill one's own individual destiny? Uh, so let me start with uh, a, very, a very broad question, uh, really, Ravi. You know, um, you talk a little bit in the book, especially at the end, about why you wrote the book. But I think it's good for everyone to, to hear that. You know, why did you, why did you write this book? You say it was a, a work that was 10 years in progress. Um, why did you write the book? All right. Well, good morning, and um, uh, Noshad. I, I must say that I'm also thrilled about being in conversation with you. It's been too long, and I'm glad JLF has uh, given us the perfect excuse to be back in touch and in conversation. Uh, now, with respect to your question, um, this, what the heck do I do with my life? This issue has bugged me almost every decade of my life. And, uh, you know, it certainly came up when I was in college and trying to figure things out. Then it, should I go abroad or should I stay in India? Um, then, you know, a little later, there, there was a choice about coming back versus staying on in the 90s. So every decade that the question has popped up and each time, instead of just squashing it and you know, hoping that it'll go away, the thought will go away. I leaned into it and it resulted in my taking on a whole new adventure. And when I look back, I think, you know, my life has been much the richer for that. And then, you know, over this decade, what I've realized is that, um, you know, more and more people seem to be wrestling with this question. There is some, you know, there's something about the times that is uh, ca causing us to, to ask this more frequently. And I particularly remember, um, you know, writing about my transition out of Microsoft and, you know, going down an uncharted path uh, about a decade ago. And I wrote this multi-part series in the Economic Times um, called Crossing the Mid-Career Chasm. And, you know, I think more than a million people uh, read it and, you know, have people come up in a restaurant or on a plane and say, hey, are you the guy who wrote that article? And, you know, I realized it, it affirmed them and gave them a lot of confidence to recognize that everybody's struggling with the same broad set of issues. Then I've started writing on LinkedIn and I found even more resonance and a wider and wider audience for this. And at some point I said, look, um, I need to put it all together in some sort of coherent way called a book fully recognizing Nosha that very few people are going to actually buy it or read it, but it forces my own clarity. It's an, you know, and um, that's what, you know, just taken me five years to write it, not because I was lazy and, you know, you know, didn't apply myself, but because it forced me to become clearer about these many of the questions. And a lot of it was trying to experientially find good solutions to some of the questions. Um, and yeah, and that's why I wrote it. And it also is a perfect excuse to engage groups in conversations such as this. If I hadn't written the book, I doubt I'd be engaging with such an interesting and wide audience around these things. So that's why I wrote it. Um, and yeah, here we are. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, it, I, I fully agree with you, by the way. You know, I, I also write to, to clarify my own thoughts. Um, because if uh, I'm not clear in my own head, what can I hope to convey that's clear to a wider audience? And it prompts that clarity, it prompts, you know, those calls that one needs to make of what really matters, what is it that you're trying to say, and just say it and don't say anything else. <laughs> it's, uh, and uh, you get by the way, that book uh, behind you is uh, in my pile waiting to be read. I'm headed to the U.S. this weekend, and I'm hoping to take it with me and um, get through it on that long flight. But uh, but yeah, this writing this 
has changed my life. If this book achieves nothing else, uh, but, but you know, providing clarity to me, um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled. You know, one of, the, one of the points that you make in the book is about being intentional. Um, and you've been amazingly intentional uh, in your career. Uh, you know, you, you know, one was when your your career at Cummins, which was sort of a dream career for uh, certainly for certainly for an engineer, you know, coming out of the IIT, yeah. um, you know, uh, with all of that, with all of that strong technical, you know, work ethic, uh, you know, applying oneself, succeeding in a really good company, the kind of company that one makes a lifetime career with, um, uh, you know, and then you give it up uh, when you're right at the, at the top of it, in a sense. Um, and at a pretty young age, yeah. uh, and completely change fields, right, to Microsoft. Uh, and then later on, you know, you move on from Microsoft, you know, one of the world's big names uh, everywhere uh, and move to something that's so unknown. Uh, and this intentional piece is to me very different because, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of used to being a cork that kind of flows around, you know, and so far the stream has taken to me to all these really great places, but um, uh, I'm not sure I'm that intentional. And I, I loved your, your, your choices. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this intentional, but were you, I mean, were you born intentional? I mean, you know, how, where did it come from? Um, how did you, what made you that way? Thank you. This, this idea of living life more intentionally and making choices with more awareness is the central idea of the book. So you bounced on exactly the core of the um, material. And, you know, in our generation, Noshad, uh, we were lucky, I think, in the sense that the world was a little bit more stable. I know you don't always agree with my uh, view on that. But it was much more stable, I think. There was a rising tide of prosperity, certainly in India, certainly in many parts of the world. And so if you were reasonably educated and you were not a complete loser, you, you could pretty much count on a reasonable life and ending up in a good place. And lots of people did that. You know, million, hundreds of millions of people did that. I think today the risk of bobbing along like a cork or a piece of driftwood, um, it feels to me much riskier that you could end up in a good place by accident, but you could also end up in a place where you don't want to be. And that's why I'd say that you need to be intentional. And it's not just about career choices. It's about a whole set of choices. You better be intentional about choosing where you live about who you hang out with, because who you hang out with shapes who you are, who you trust, okay? Uh, that becomes, uh, that, is, that wasn't such a big issue 30, 40 years ago. Today, that's become a very, very central uh, matter. Um, how you define success, okay? And therefore, the choices that you make around, you know, what you pursue and so forth, what you pay attention to. So many of us are just completely immersed in social media and they're going crazy. Um, so in being intentional about what you pay attention to is important. So, uh, you know, and I, you, you, your question says I was very intentional about career choices, but, and that's probably where I started out. But oh, as I've grown older, I've become much more thoughtful and intentional about each of these questions. Okay. And vis-a-vis -vis career, I think all I did was follow curiosity. Okay. I, I didn't, I wasn't unduly influenced by what society thought was a good job or a good career or a good choice. I simply said, is this interesting? Would I regret if, regret it if I didn't pursue this? And if the answer was yes, I overcame my fears and jumped in. And so, yeah, uh, you know, my mother and uh, all my sort of family and well-wishers said, don't leave Cummins. It's such a good company. You've worked hard to earn your perch. Microsoft was sort of this Facebook of its time. Why would you want to go there? This is going to end badly. And I said, look, when I turn 50, 
will I re regret having tried it and failed or would I regret not having had the guts and passed up the opportunity? And I said, no, I'm going to go there. And then I've done this, you know, all my life. The Bank of Baroda thing came. It seemed crazy. Again, everybody said, don't do this. You know, Warren Buffett has a wonderful phrase that says, when a good manager meets a bad business, it is the reputation of the business that survives intact. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so uh, everybody said, don't do this. And then Raghu said, look, you've been writing about all these things and now here's a call to action. So get on with it. As same way, now I'm taken, gone on into climate change. I don't know if you saw the announcement two yes, days ago. I yes. I'm moving into the energy space and climate. I don't know anything about it. I have no idea how it will turn out. But my curiosity says this is the issue of our times. So if I'm not in there, I'm missing out. And I rarely look back on, with any regret on these things. Thank you. You know, the I wanted to talk some about the changing nature of work, which is an underlying theme in the book, uh, in about how the world is changing around us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about whether it's changing for good or worse, um, but the changing nature of work. You know, and you, you have this uh, quote early on in the book where you say, you know, uh, artificial intelligence has closed in on, uh, closed in and often exceeded human capability uh, at narrow tasks, astonishingly fast. And, you know, you, you use the phrase on, at narrow tasks, astonishing, astonishingly fast. And I wonder what uh, this says about the need for education, because you deal with that uh, a few times, two, three times in the book about yeah. the, the changing demand of education, the changing role education played in, 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 in making us bob along uh, in the right stream um, and uh, indeed uh, maybe even move ahead uh, in the stream some, uh, you know, it, it gave us some extra power. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that what, what's changing so much in the, in the nature of work and what does that say about how we can, how we ourselves should be more intentional about preparing ourselves for this uh, changed world and this changing nature of what, what future occupations should be for us. Yeah, you, so you've got two related questions here, right? One is about the way work is changing and then what its implications are for education. So first of all, work is changing in ways that are, you know, inconceivable, you, sort of for a variety of reasons, M multiple trends converging. The first is that companies are finding themselves in a much more turbulent environment, okay, much more uncertainty, much more turbulence, more shocks. And so more and more employers, and I don't know about your own company, Noshad, are increasingly using flexible contracts, flexible work arrangements. So there's a diminishingly small core of permanent employees. And then you use consultants, contractors, gig workers, all these different forms of contracting to acquire skills and talent. And so that's one big trend. Another big trend is just productivity. And due to either software or robotics or you know, some combination of the two. And <clears throat> we're seeing just dramatic improvements in productivity. You know, six years ago when I was at Infosys, we did an estimate that half of all programming could be automated. That was six years ago. Okay. And now we are in this new domain called low code, no code. So you, you know, machines are able to turn out code better than humans, or at least an average human being. And this is true in every realm, right? So Amazon operates any number of stores where there's not a single human being. So you just walk in, pick up the stuff and walk out and the cameras are watching and they debit your credit card and out you go. So I don't think we've seen anything yet in terms of the impact of automation on jobs. Then you've, during COVID, we've seen this enormous acceleration of remote work, which is also accelerating this <clears throat> trend towards flexible working. I talk about the impact of uh, a longer life 
That is, if you live to your 90s, then most of us will need to or wish to work till we are in our late, late 70s, except employers have this increasing preference for younger people with you know, new ideas and uh, you know, contemporary skills. So sooner or later, we're going to have to learn to you know, fend for ourselves. So all these things are coming together and colliding to, one, to drive one inevitable conclusion which is jobs as we know them, careers as we know them, are going to apply to a diminishingly smaller number of people, okay? And therefore, most of us would be prudent, wise to focus on how do we, as quickly as possible, learn to be self-employed, freelancer, gig worker of different sorts, if not an entrepreneur, not everybody is, wants to be or is cut out to be an entrepreneur, but whatever, on the spectrum, you better be there. And even if you end up working at a co good company for a long time, mentally, I say you're going to be better off framing your life, uh, your career as a series of projects. In this case, 20 years with, this, <laughs> with the same organization or the same client. I think that framing will just allow you to be better off. So this thing about education systems, how are they preparing you for this, this kind of a future? Not at all in most parts of the world. The education system in almost every country still is gearing up people towards a world that doesn't exist, a stable world, a world in which if you have got education, there are jobs waiting for you. Okay, so the supply is less than the demand. Uh, and it teach and a world in which information is scarce. So how much of our education system is about absorbing information? Whereas today, you, that's, you know, anybody with access to the internet has, you know, doesn't need to remember much. You need to be able to find information rather than no information. What is important now is a whole host of other things, which are more around mindset and skill set. So entrepreneurial mindset and skills, for instance, is very important, we think, not just for entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs. Even to survive and flourish in such a fast-changing world, you need to be able to see opportunities and seize them. You need to be resourceful. You need to be able to convince people of your ideas. So, you know, pitch. You need to be tenacious. These are all entrepreneurial traits which are going to serve everybody well. They're not taught in any education system or corporate training uh, program. Then you talk about 21st century skills. I talk about the fact that paradoxically, even as AI is becoming more and more pervasive, you know, the human sk skills are becoming even more precious. The ability to communicate to work collaboratively, to solve problem, complex problems together, you know, creativity. These skills are becoming more and more crucial. So paradoxically, we'll do better by being more human rather than more, you know, trying to outrun the machines. And again, these are not things that most contemporary education programs, uh, you know, impart to people. And so the issue is not how do you, reimagine education because that's an impossibly hard thing N not that we're trivializing the importance of you know literacy numeracy learning how to learn um you know the classics etc but i do think you need to complement it with this sort of experiential learning which scarily is not there in either the formal education or in the you know online programs that people are supposed to self-serve or in corporate training and so my appeal to individuals is, look, take charge of your life. Don't leave this to somebody else, not your employer, not your school, not your college. Go figure out how you learn these things. So, Long-winded answer. No, so I, I definitely, I definitely uh, subscribe to your, 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 your last statement. And we'll come back to the education uh, point in a, in, in a bit. Uh, but I, 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 I just want to push you a little on the changing nature of work and your yeah. comment about emphasis um, because you know you said look emphasis six years ago said that half of these programming jobs are going to go away no half of the programming work can be automated okay half the programming work can be work. Automated. that doesn't necessarily mean half the jobs but some some part of everybody's job can be automated 
and the lower levels, much more can be automated in the higher levels. Our senior architect, for instance, little less. So, so if you, but if you look at Infosys as a company today versus six years ago, Infosys as a company today versus six years ago employs many more people than it did six years ago. Um, as far as I know, um, maybe many thousands of people more than it did six years ago. So Infosys is a large employer. Um, it is is today a bigger opportunity for people to get those good jobs um, that well, you're kind of arguing against. So, I mean, you know, so no, the no, no, I'm not arguing to, against. First of all, huh? I really hope large, good employers like Infosys and Forbes mm -hmm. Marshall survive and thrive and create stable employment for lots of people. I'm just saying, if you're an individual, don't count on it, okay? I that's all. Now, now, with regard to Infosys or any of these large companies, what you're not seeing is what's happening at a more granular level, which is every year thousands of people are being pushed out, you know, for product because of performance, lack of the right skills, productivity, etc. And more thousands are being recruited who bring in more of the right skills and the mindset. Now, what happens to those who are, we are looking at only the net addition and say, oh, they grew. Of course they grew. Mm -hmm. But you're not seeing the two different outcomes here for two different groups. The second thing is, if you look at revenue per employee, which is a measure of productivity, uh, most of these firms are doing a nice job growing revenue per employee, which means sure. the growth is coming more and more efficiently. And we ain't seen nothing yet. I think the real b benefits of automation have yet to be deployed and kicked in fully uh, in these firms. Okay, yes. so it's, it's a sort of an S curve. So I, so I'm simply saying there's just fewer of these good jobs. So you know, so so my I guess my starting point is sort of the I'm going to go back 200 years, right? So 250 years to the British Industrial Revolution. Um, and you had this group of people called the Luddites who used to go around breaking up new uh, highly productive textile machinery because they they saw that as a threat to their livelihoods um, and uh, 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 and but the net effect of uh, automation as it was then 250 years ago was that it ended up making goods so much cheaper that so many more people could buy them that so many more people needed to make them that the net effect was that employment went up and it not only went up during the British Industrial Revolution, it continued to go up, as we've seen, over the last 250 years. Um, why is the future going to be different to how it's been over the last 250 years? And why is automation going to net-net destroy jobs? Net-net. I'm not talking about individual jobs that will change dramatically. Many jobs will be destroyed. But the net aggregate number of jobs will be less or more? You're saying less or more? Good. I'm glad you asked the question and took us back to the first industrial revolution. So your narrative, the popular narrative is incomplete. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's true, but it's incomplete. What it doesn't account for is a couple of things. Uh, what happened to people who were traditionally working on manual spinning machines and how many of them got reskilled and absorbed in the new automated um, domain? And it turns out that two generations of people got crushed. So there's a transition woes, which in aggregate may not matter, but if it's you, you your life could get crushed. Number two, the industrial revolution, as you know, Noshad, coincided with colonialism. So a lot of the bad effects of automation got exported to the colonies, most notably India. And I wrote a lot about what happened to weavers. Okay. And so you saw prosperity happening in one part of the world, Britain and Western Europe, but the impact of job losses was conveniently um, exported. So here too, you, will, you may see Silicon Valley thrive and Shanghai thrive and you could have very large job losses elsewhere, potentially. So look, uh, it, nobody has a crystal ball, but look, there are enough, 
yeah, with this AI is only one of the technologies. It's part of a whole set called the fourth industrial revolution. Oh. Net, net over time, would these create jo uh, jobs? Absolutely, yes. In the transition, would there be net losses? Most likely, yes. Okay. And the most important thing here is what happens to an individual. And since this book is aimed not at Mac policymakers, CEOs, it's aimed at individuals, I'm saying, look, this is not a trend that you can do anything about. So the best thing you can do is figure out how to make that trend into a tailwind rather than a headwind for you. Okay. So we, even if I didn't like this, I can't wish it away. But how do I equip myself so that I can ride this, this trend and make it favorable to me is the important thing. So I get at it more from the individual, but I'm not at all sanguine that for most individuals, the next 20 years are going to be great as a result of automation. It is going to be phenomenal for a few, um, but for a lot of people, it's going to be net negative. And then a new generation will come in and they'll find new opportunities in the new technologies around decarbonization, or synthetic biology, et cetera. But for the dude who's repairing diesel engines, ain't looking too good. So, so you know, so, so I, I, I mean, I fully agree with you that particular, particular skills, uh, particular. you know, will, will vanish um, uh, as they have for the last 250 years. And they will, keep, they will keep vanishing. Maybe they'll vanish at a higher pace. So, you know, but, but we'll, we'll continue this discussion maybe sometime over a drink, but, the, uh, but we'll move on because I know we have, we, have limited, we have limited time. I wanted to ask you about the higher education point because you make some very interesting comments. You know, you say higher education is no longer an assurance of a reasonable life. Um, and, uh, you know, you say the education system in most countries is designed for a world that is fast disappearing, right? Um, uh, and my, my response was, is it this, or is it that the education that people get isn't that great? Um, in other words, and that this has maybe even always been so, uh, and as increasing proportions of the world get educated, go through the higher education system. Um, is, it that, is it that more than anything else? Is it massification of higher education that, uh, uh, yeah. that, is, uh, that is actually giving us uh, this phenomenon? Or is it uh, that higher education in a sense is failing? And I have a sort of follow on, which is related to that, which is, you make a plea for generalists. Um, and this plea for generalists, is, you know, it resonates very strongly with me. I mean, I've been a great believer in the liberal arts education um, process, you know, that instead of uh, narrow, technicals, narrow technical skills, uh, you start off at least with enough general understanding of the world uh, and ability to deal with it and ability to jump on and learn those new skills constantly. So I, I, fully, I fully subscribe uh, on the liberal arts piece and the generalist piece. Um, and I worry about where we are in India, uh, where we produce over a million engineers a year um, in a world that's changing the way that you describe. Um, and uh, we are producing millions of people who have relatively narrow technical skills um, in a particular field of engineering, uh, not permitted to take courses outside of their own engineering field, let alone outside of engineering. Um, you know, so I fully resonate with you on that. And I wonder if you could talk, uh, talk about uh, your, your perspective on this, please. Well, you wonderfully asked the question and answered it too. <laughs> well, the second one, <laughs> the second one. No, yeah. So I think, no, you really have answered it. The, the reason why higher education is no longer a passport to a better life is on one hand, supply demand. You've it, ma graduating massively more number of people with higher education and you haven't done much on the demand side. Demand, if anything, is more anemic than it was. So that's part of it. 
the but this figure for India is stunning, which I first didn't believe, and then I verified and cross-checked and cross-checked. A young person with a higher education degree, think BSc, BA, or MSc, MA, um, is six times as likely to be unemployed today as his or her illiterate friend. Okay, so it tells you two things. A, the quality of these degrees is probably such that many are not employable without significant remediation. Number two, the quality of work we are creating is so low end and as lacking, you know, uh, it's not aspirational, that a lot of people prefer to just sit it out and hope that someday some better job will come. So both these things are happening. The th companies are also beginning to say, look, this it, the degree is worth nothing. I'm going to test for aptitude. Okay, so the, in the old days, if you went to a reasonable college, that, that credential, that pedigree was enough to get you in. But now, you know, whether it's a TCS or a Google or an Amazon, they're subjecting you to your, their own aptitude test, and that is way more important than a higher education degree. Um, so, yeah, so which is saying something about the relevance of these uh, programs, if you will. And so, yeah, in all the ways that you have already talked about, they, you need a re significant reinvention. So we're not teaching them how to learn, learning to learn. We're not teaching them how to spot on, uh, spot opportunities and act on them. For instance, if you're an engineer today, my God, there's never been more opportunity to solve problems and build a little business around it, right? You take waste, we're drowning in waste. Okay, you take this whole, what is very broadly termed climate change and what opportunities there are. You think about, um, the, we want to become Atma Nirbhar. We want to buy less from, import less from China and we make practically nothing. And we can't even seem to make rakis. Okay, so if you had, if the education system were working, you'd turn out people with not just some, you know, of these skills, but also the mindset and wherewithal to get on with tackling these problems and building, uh, you know, a little micro enterprise or a, or a reasonable size enterprise, but none of that is happening. Um, you talk about generalists. Yeah, the ideal profile actually turns out to be a T profile where you have some depth in one area and then you're a generalist on top. And so you can, you know, move along. I think you and I represent that, that sort of a profile and it allows you to over time you know, navigate ma many transitions and so forth. Yeah, but look, um, I, yeah, the education system is increasingly irrelevant in India and everywhere. I, I, I worry sometimes that uh, in my case, you know, I have a very solid plank on top and a very rickety uh, T oh, heading down. <laughs> so, so just your modesty, yeah. So, no? So, you know, I know, we're, I know we're right out of time, but I, I, I wanted to close really with the, uh, with what you close your book with, which I think is a, a really beautiful quote from Jim March. And it fits in very nicely with uh, what you were talking about with regard to education just now. Because when I was doing, when I was doing my PhD and when I was, uh, right after I finished my PhD and I used to teach, I used to go and meet him. Uh, oh, you and, knew Jim. And, and get his advice on, uh, on, on actually on what I was doing, but much more, you know, I would five minutes on what I was doing and 55 minutes on life. Um, and you have this wonderful last sentence in your book where you say, quoting Jim March, you say, what might make a difference to us if in our tiny roles, in our brief time, we inhabit life gently and add more beauty than ugliness. Um, and I, I think your book did that. Um, your book did that in a very nice way. Uh, and uh, uh, it did it for me, uh, and I hope it will do it for many, many others. Uh, but last word to you, Ravi. Well, I don't think you can improve on that statement. If there is yeah. anything that has stuck with me over some years, uh, he wrote this back in 2010. Yeah. If there's anything that has stuck with me, inspired me, and today, you know, has given me clarity of, how I wish to make live my life, you know, uh, the choices I make. It is this: can can you be walk life more gently, which includes gen gentleness and kindness to others, not yeah. just the planet. 
And can you, how do you use your unique gifts, experience, assets to make the world slightly better than it is? And I think if you can just define success in these terms, joy is yours. And I certainly uh, have found that. But thank you for that uh, wonderful endorsement. I profoundly appreciate it. But thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greatly, greatly enjoyed the chat and look forward to continuing it uh, at greater length soon. Yeah, and I'm glad I made you finally read a help, uh, self-help book. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Your first and last. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi Venkatesan and Noshad Forbes for that insightful conversation. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across three of our venues, Front Lawn, Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. Hope to see you soon in the next session.